Thank you so much for participating in the uh, Fairside Chats. We appreciate that very much. It's an opportunity for me to visit with the Republican candidates uh, that are running for president. And uh, as we lead up to the first in the nation caucus on January 15th, uh, which you're very familiar with. but. Uh, I want to just say thanks, uh, Vice President, for being here. Did you hear me? I'm going back and forth between Mike and Vice President, so I might get a I little. I Mike. I might get a little informal uh, as we get into the discussion. But former Congressman, former Governor, former Vice President, thank you for being here and giving us the chance uh, to uh, ask you a few questions. Let's give you a couple minutes for opening comments. Welcome, the Vice President. Well, thank you so much. How about a big round of applause for Governor Kim Reynolds, everybody? I. Uh, <laughs> it is great to be back at the Iowa State Fair. Karen and I are excited about an afternoon involving pork and the butter cow. <laughs> She's headed to see bunny rabbits and bees. I'm headed to see livestock. There's a cow I met actually on the road traveling around Iowa named Chippy. So I'm looking for Chippy today, and uh, I'm, lo I'm hoping Chippy does well. But it's great <laughs> to be with you. I can honestly say... Yeah, I was for Governor Kim Reynolds before it was cool. <laughs> Part of my background she just references that I was governor of the state of Indiana, and my lieutenant governor had much in common with what was then your lieutenant governor. They became fast friends, and yeah. my lieutenant governor came to me and said, you have to meet the lieutenant governor uh, <laughs> of Iowa. Uh, and I met her. I saw her quality early on. And uh, uh, it is great to be here at the Fairside Chat. It is great to be back with you. But uh, Governor Kim Reynolds, let me just say on behalf of people all across the country, thanks for your principled leadership you. and your clarion voice for conservative values. We're Thank so you. grateful. Thank you. Well, I got to tell you, the only problem Chippy is going to have if he's competing against Frank the Tank for the <laughs> governor's uh, uh, steer show, so charity steer show. So as long as Chippy's not in that, he should be okay. <laughs> I got it. But uh, we're going to do everything we can to do that. <laughs> so thank you for your principled leadership as well. And, uh, you know, you've said many times, I'm a Christian, I'm a conservative, and I'm a Republican in that order. Um, so talk a little bit about the role of faith in your life and just the champion that you've been for life in general. Well, well, thank, thank you so much, Governor. It's... Um, for me, for my family, faith is what's most important. You know, I made three great decisions as a young man. Uh, after walking away from the religion of my youth, I was off at college, and I began to meet some young people that talked to me about having a personal relationship with God. I hadn't heard that kind of language before. I found myself at a, uh, at a Christian music festival at a place called Asbury University. That's much in the news lately. And it was there listening to Christian music like they had here at the Iowa State Fair last night with King and Country and other bands. I, uh, it was like I heard for the first time that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever might believe in him might not perish but have everlasting life. And I, I stood up, I walked down, and I found a young volunteer pastor and prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And it changed my life forever. That was the most important decision I ever made. The second most important decision was the day that I followed Karen Whitaker out the back of one church. <laughs> and then we walked out the front of that church a year and a half later. And she's been my wife for 38 years. And she was the best second lady the United States of America has ever had. And the third most important decision I made is that, you know, full disclosure, I, I actually started in politics as a teenager. I was involved in the Democratic Party. I was the Youth Democrat Party coordinator in Bartholomew County, Indiana, back in the 70s. And, uh, but then I started to hear the voice and the values of the 40th president of the United States. And um, I joined the Reagan Revolution and never looked back. And my faith and my family and my commitment to the conservative agenda, I hope, uh, has defined our career. And I promise you, whatever the people of Iowa and America have in store for us in the future, We'll always build our future on those lodestars of faith and family and a commitment to freedom. We appreciate that so, so help much. Me God. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, a lot accomplished during your time as vice president, but can you maybe talk about a couple things that you're really proud of that really stand out uh, as you served this country as the vice president? Well, when we came into office, uh, there had been eight years of the Obama administration that had hollowed out our nation's military. I mean, literally reckless budget cuts. I'll never forget in our first month in office, I heard from leaders in the Air Force that we had 
we had aircraft on the ground being used for spare parts to keep other aircraft in the air. And so I couldn't be more proud to have been part of an administration that, that made the largest increased investment in our national defense since the days of Ronald Reagan. We rebuilt our military. We finally gave our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guard the support they needed to defend this nation. I, I'm proud of that as a vice president, but I'm also proud of the fact that uh, uh, our son is a captain in the United States Marine Corps. And uh, one of our unworthy son-in-laws is a lieutenant in the United States Navy. So it's personal for us. And uh, uh, frankly, to see the way the Biden administration uh, has been uh, working to cut military spending since they first came into office is another reason why I stepped forward. I mean, even the recent uh, budget ceiling, debt ceiling deal that they did, uh, actually, if they don't finish all their work, it'll result in a 1% cut in military spending. You know, at a time that China is literally dropping uh, a new warship in the Asia Pacific about every month, uh, we have an administration that literally is uh, growing government, growing mandates, growing spending, but working to cut defense spending. Uh, that all changes the day that I become president of the United States, I promise you. Thank you for that. I think the weakness on the world stage is scary, what we're seeing right now, and it's just an invitation uh, for, for some really bad things. You know, so we ask um, Iowans to weigh in with some questions. So, you know, gas prices are rising, inflation is still a problem. The majority, probably 51% of Americans are still pessimistic about the economy. They still believe we're in a downturn and it's going to get worse. So Brett from Davenport wants to know, as president, what steps would you take, well, of course, to lower gas and food prices, but to really deal with Bidenomics? Well, Bidenomics is a failure despite all the happy talk coming out of Washington, D.C. You can tell there's an election coming up because all of a sudden Democrats of the White House are telling you how their policies are all working. <laughs> kind of reminds me of what Groucho Marx said one time in an old movie. He said, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes, right? I mean, the American people see what's happening out there. Inflation's up 16.6%. The war on energy by the Biden administration has caused gasoline prices to be up 60%. Percent. They just jumped up again last week. The crisis at our border is 100% man-made, and that man's name is Joe Biden. I mean, we, uh, we secured the southern border of the United States of America by, by building hundreds of miles of wall, by negotiating a remain in Mexico policy with the Mexicans and using Title 42. They dismantled all of that literally on day one. Now we have the worst border crisis in American history. What we're going to do about it is, I will tell you, I think I'm the first candidate for president in our party to come out with a plan to deal with inflation. And just this week, we came out with a plan to achieve energy independence again. I mean, look, the inflation that's happening in America today, economists on the right and the left all know is because of runaway spending in Washington, D.C. Uh, Kim, you know something about balancing budgets and cutting taxes. We did that back when I was governor of Indiana as well. But when this administration came in office, worked with that Democrat Congress, they spent $2 trillion in unnecessary COVID spending. And every economist in the country agrees that that lit the pilot light on the worst inflation in 40 years. And so what we're going to do is, is we're going to get spending under control. We're going to cancel unexpended, unnecessary spending in Washington, D.C. And I promise you, as your president, we're going to drive toward balancing a federal budget, and we're going to reform these old programs to save our nation from a mountain range of debt. You know, I think, look, Social Security and Medicare are a promise we've made to the American people, right? We're going to keep that yep. promise. Yep. You'll hear the demagogues again, you know, saying that Republicans are going to cut benefits to Grandma. It's common, you know, just put your armor on, all right? But i got to tell you, folks, we were hugging some kids on our way around the corner here. and We just had three of the most perfect granddaughters ever born in the history of the world in the last two years. I have 11 of them. Yeah. All right, now you're just bragging. I know. Karen says I'm showing off. Yes, I am. Okay. But we have a national debt the size of our nation's economy today. You know that, Governor. First time since World War II. And I think the time has come to have leadership in the White House that is honest with the American people and says, look, for everybody in retirement, we're not going to change anything. If you got hair the same color as me, it's not going to affect you at all. Frankly, anybody 40 years old or older, we're not going to change it. I don't believe in changing horses in the middle of the stream, right? 
But for anybody under the age of 40, like that young lady back there, I'd like to have a conversation. That maybe we could reform these New Deal programs and actually give you a better deal by making sure that Social Security and Medicare are actually there for you and that this mountain range of debt that's driving inflation, it's going gonna, it's gonna to literally bury our economy under debt and what the Democrats want to do, higher taxes, isn't there. So I think, I think tackling runaway spending, bringing about reform, and I'm going to tell you what, we did it before, we'll do it again. We're going to unleash American energy and allow the American people to achieve American energy independence and dominance once again. Amen. And you know what? Just the federal government needs to operate like the states. You did it as a governor. Balance budget, spending less than you take right. in, 99 percent of revenue. Last year, we spent 82 percent of available revenue. We still cut taxes. We still invested in education. You can do both, but it's ridiculous the runaway spending that we're seeing. So I'm going to. Well, you've done it. You've done both. And then there's yes. another piece of this too. Let me tell you something. Washington is not only too big and spends too much, but it does too much. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the reasons, I, maybe it's because I was a governor, but I'm going to tell you what, if I'm your president, we're going to shut down the Federal Department of Education. We're going to send those resources oh, back to the state. Oh, he jumped a question. He's got it. And yeah. we're going to revive federalism in America yeah. because America's governors, Republican governors, are proving every day every. that you can deliver prosperity and security and opportunity for your people. we got to, we got to, we got to have we got to have a season where we're returning to the states and to the American people what our founders intended under the 10th amendment to yep. the constitution. Yep, exactly. So while we're talking about education, you were a vocal opponent uh, of the Lindmar schools policies that allowed kids right. to change their gender, their pronouns, their names uh, without parents knowing. Uh, Iowa, this legislative session, we banned that. We made it clear. Can you believe we had to put into code that parents will be the primary decision makers of their children's education? But that's where we're at today. Um, did you ever, ever think that we would get to this point where we would actually have to put something like that into law? And how do you address that uh, as the President of the United States? Well, first, Governor, I, I just want to thank you for your bold leadership and the leadership of uh, your Lieutenant Governor, who I know is with us today, and also members of uh, your state legislature yep. who yep. stepped forward. Yep. Look, when I first heard about the Linmar Community Schools here in Iowa, I, I, it took my breath away. We heard from parents, I set up a foundation in Washington, and they said, we'd like your help with this federal lawsuit because at Linmar Community Schools, you'd have to have a note from your parents to get a Tylenol from the school nurse, but you could get a gender transition plan without ever telling you, your mom and dad or getting their permission. I mean, that, that, uh, that radical gender ideology that's taken hold in that school is taken hold in schools all across the country. Uh, and it's one of the reasons we weighed in heavily on that lawsuit. I'm, I'm confident. I'm confident our conservative majority on the Supreme Court, if they take up the case, is going to get it right. We have got to make it clear that parents don't co-parent with government. <laughs> parents are in charge of their children's education. And we've got to protect our kids from this radical gender ideology. It's another reason why I've been very clear. I mean, I... I as President of the United States, I'm, I'm proud of the fact of what Iowa's done, what Indiana has done to protect yeah. our kids from chemical and, and surgical gender transition treatment. But I'll tell you what, as President of the United States, we're going to protect America's children from gender uh, transition, chemical or surgical. We've got to protect our kids in this country, they and we will. It should not be an experiment. I promise you. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh. So, um, I talk, so what's something uh, we may not know about your childhood or your young adulthood that has shaped who you are today? A little bit back to that first question, but. Well, I mean, you may not know that I'm the grandson of an Irish immigrant. My grandfather's name was Richard Michael Cawley. He stepped off onto Ellis Island, a boat in Ireland in 1923. And that's how Richard... Richard Michael Cawley came here, and that's how Michael Richard Pence got to be Vice President of the United States. I mean, my family uh, really lived the American dream. It's one of the things that drives Karen and I. You know, we were raised to believe to whom much is given, much will be required. We, in many ways, I grew up at the footstool of the American dream. My grandfather, that Irish immigrant, is one of the best men I ever knew. He came to America, drove a bus for 40 years in Chicago. It's one of the reasons I'm a Cub fan. My folks grew up on the south side. 
My dad was a Sox fan, admittedly. But they followed work down to southern Indiana and uh, built everything that matters. You know, a family, a business, and a good name. I grew up in a small business family. And my dad was a combat veteran in the Korean War. I wrote a book about uh, my life not long ago, and the publisher told me when I turned it in, they said, you know, we th my dad's been gone more than 30 years. But they said, you know, we think your dad is the secret star of this book. And it blessed my heart. So my dad was the best man I ever knew. He loved this country, he raised us to believe in giving back. And so uh, if you want to understand, uh, understand Mike Pence, you need to... You need to know Karen, and frankly, you need to know this incredible family I've been blessed to live in. I, we live the American dream, yes. and I'm running to make sure that the American dream is alive and well for future generations of Americans here in Iowa and across the country. We talked a little bit about the weakness on the world stage, and we see it every single day with an absent president and administration, and especially with the aggression with China. So. Talk, can you just talk a little bit more, um, Vice President, about how that's impacted and continues to impact our national security? And again, just, you know, what do we need to do, uh, turn that around? And what we're seeing at the southern border, as you talked about, is a big piece of that. Look, President Joe Biden is weak in this country at home and abroad. And that disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan has emboldened the enemies of freedom around the world. As your Vice President, I had the privilege to travel around the world. I've I've met many of these leaders. I've been to many of these countries. And I, ha I know in my heart of hearts the reason why Russia never even tried to redraw international lines by force under our administration the only time in the 21st century is because they saw the way we were building up our military. They saw the way that we, we unleashed our armed forces to take down ISIS. They saw the way we sent those cruise missiles into Syria when they used chemical weapons on innocent civilians. And they saw us take down the most dangerous terrorists in the world, Qasem Soleimani. It was a credible threat of the use of force and a strong military in the United States. It kept the world a whole lot more quiet in our four years than it is right now. But the truth is, I really do believe that withdrawal from Afghanistan under President Biden never would have happened if we'd still been in office. But it was a disgrace. But I want to say to anybody here who wore the uniform of the United States, especially those that served in Afghanistan, nothing of that disastrous withdrawal will ever diminish the honor and gratitude that is owed to men and women that served in Afghanistan over the last 20 years defending our country. But I have to tell you that it gets a little personal with us about what happened in Afghanistan. Karen and I, are we're Marine Corps parents. That's what we're awful proud of our boy and his wife and their girls. So when Humberto Sanchez, one of the 13 that fell at the Kabul airport, came home, along with 12 other American heroes, uh, we just we drove up to Logansport, Indiana, to go and, and just be with their family, to pray with them, encourage them. And I have to tell you, those of you that worry about the future of this country, you need to hear Humberto's story. Humberto uh, actually didn't get to walk across the stage, his mom told me, at... Uh, Logan Sport High School because he had a little bit of trouble in high school. <laughs> he had to finish in summer school. But a little bit after he finished high school, he apparently came and found his mom and he said, look, I want to make you proud. I'm going to go be a Marine. And by all accounts, Umberto became a Marine's Marine, deeply respected by all his fellow Marines. And he came to that day where he was manning one of those gates at the Kabul airport, Governor. And the word came out that somebody had gotten past the outside wire, somebody that looked dangerous. And the word, word went down through the radios that everybody was to pull back, get inside the wall. And Umberto refused. His mom and his fellow Marines said that Umberto said, most of the people in the line at my gate are women and children, and I, I, I got to get them through. I got to get as many through as I can. And by all accounts, he took the brunt of the blast. His mother looked at me with tears in her eyes as Karen and I gathered with her and said, his last act on earth was a work of heart. So despite the weakness of this administration that's emboldened the enemies of freedom, I'm going to tell you what, Umberto Sanchez is America. This is a great nation, and we will stand in the gap, and we will bring this country back with his inspiration in our hearts.
So we're about to wrap up here, but before we kind of close out, we've got the fast three. At least it's not the the fast three. The fast three. So give me one funny campaign moment on the campaign trail. One, one, just one. I know exactly. Anybody that's been out there, there's multiple, right? <laughs> well, I would say how many times people tell me that uh, your husband looks like me. That's what I was gonna say too. I was gonna say. <laughs> so yeah. Kevin was at an event that the vice president was at, and they came up and asked him for his autograph, <laughs> and he goes, "Well, you want my autograph? Well, why?" And he goes. Uh, it, they said, well, the vice president says, I'm Kevin Reynolds, so yeah. we, we can stump for you anytime you need somebody to stump and for let you. Let me just say with confidence, he's a very handsome man. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay, so you've been on the fairgrounds a couple days now. Love Favorite it. fair food that you've had or looking forward to having? Uh, haven't, haven't had a, apparently I have now had a lemon Nation. shake. -up. There we go, there we go. I'm a lemon shake-up guy at the state <laughs> fair, and uh, can't leave without a corn dog. Okay, awesome. although I think we're headed to the I think we're headed to the pork tent to go to work. There you go. In just a few minutes, but uh, the Iowa Fair is many things. It's, it's agriculture. It's fun. But for me, the Iowa State Fair is food. It is food. I and agree. We're going to enjoy it just like the rest of you. Another thing, we, and you'll walk it off. So I'm quite confident <laughs> that. Okay, last Not one. All of it. Your favorite walkout song. Well, you know, I know. <laughs> this is the hard one. <laughs> yeah, no, I look, I, I got an awful lot on my iPhone. Uh, but uh, when I first ran for governor, there was a song that we always walked out to. And it's um, These Are My People oh. by Rodney Atkins. It's where I come from. Right. And uh, big fan. Over thank here. you. We got one more <laughs> Rodney Atkins fan here. Everybody's on their I mean, phone. I think one yeah. of the reasons that Karen and I feel so at home, we had a great day yesterday at the fair, and I want to thank you all for taking a minute to hear us out this morning. Is uh, Iowa just feels like home. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in a small town, uh, had a cornfield in the backyard. The 4-H fair was the biggest thing in the summer. The state fair was the biggest thing in the state. And uh, I have to tell you, I just promise you, you give me the privilege to be your president. Uh, I'm going to fight for the values and the ideals and the integrity and the character of the people of Iowa and the heartland of this country. So Thank help you. me God. Thank you. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to even build on that if you want. Yeah. So as I travel the state, people tell me they're looking for a leader. They want somebody to stand up for the American people, for the country or freedoms. Uh, somebody's got conviction to do the right thing, the resolve to follow through. But they're talking about that they want somebody to win. So tell all of us that are gathered here why you are that person. And you've, you've done a good job of saying that, but any, just anything that you want to add? Well, I'm running for president because I think this country's in a lot of trouble. I mean, to be honest with you, after we left the White House, our life's been pretty good. We moved home to Indiana. We bought five acres and a pond. I bought a John Deere riding mower. Life is good. 54-inch deck, zero turn radius. Got a red pickup truck, got three granddaughters. But when I saw the devastation that Joe Biden and the Democrats have wrought on this nation at home and abroad, we just couldn't sit this one out. I said it before, I'll say it again. It's one of the lodestars of our life. To whom much is given, much will be required. And I believe the opportunity that we had to serve in the Congress for 12 years, I was a House conservative leader before it was cool. I fought against the big spenders in the, in the Republican Party for much of that time. I was governor of a state like your great governor. We showed you you can cut taxes and balance budgets and support the sanctity of life and expand educational opportunities. And thank you for Iowa leading the way on expanding parental educational choice to families. And then uh, having had the privilege to be your vice president in four extraordinary years, Years that we made America more prosperous and more secure than ever before. You know, I was always loyal to President Donald Trump until the day came that my oath to the Constitution required me to do otherwise. But I'll always be proud of the record of the Trump-Pence administration. And I'll always believe that we charted a course for restoring American security and prosperity. I'm running because uh, I think this is no time for on-the-job training. The challenges America is facing uh, in the world are profound, and we need leadership that can appeal to the better angels of our nature, leadership that can at least have the possibility of bringing the American people together to strengthen our nation, to revive our economy, to defend our values. 
Uh, and my hope is as we travel to all 99 counties, all righty. as we make an effort to be at every pizza ranch, <laughs> every Casey's, I, uh, my hope is that uh, we'll have the opportunity to earn your support. Uh, and I promise you, you give me the opportunity to be the Republican nominee. We're going to defeat Joe Biden in 2024, and we're going to bring this country all the way back on a foundation of conservative values. Yes. Please give a loud round of applause for Vice President Mike Pence.